Truth Seeker and or its affiliates are not responsible for any strange phenomena that may occur during or after listening to this podcast, which may include the following. Heightened senses of awareness, psychic abilities, UFO sightings, alien contact, time loss, out-of-body experiences, ringing in the ears, ESP, lucid dreaming, increased synchronicities, astral projection, telepathy, stronger intuition, levitation, miraculous healings, and or remote viewing. Please be advised to listen at your own discretion. going on ladies and gentlemen boys and girls this is the truth seeker podcast thank you guys for hanging out with me today so shout out to everybody who's already in the chat shout out to everybody listening on your podcasting apps no matter where you are thank you for hanging out with us today got an awesome show planned for you all want to say a huge thank you to uh, everybody who is supporting my work via patreon I uh, could not do this without your help, so thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. I want to give a shout out to the newest patrons we have within the last week or so. Shout out to Stephen Scully. Thank you for believing in the work and coming on, brother. Shout out to Sonny Horath. Shout out to you, brother. Um, Adam Brink. Special thank you to you as well. And Dylan Mason. You guys rock, man. Thank you guys for believing in the work and coming on and partnering with me via Patreon. If you'd like to support... Head on over to patreon.com backslash truthseeker. There you get access to my entire discography of work. You get access to 200 plus songs, all the new music that I'm doing. Just put out a new album called the ESP EP, uh, dealing with extrasensory perception and clairvoyance, clara audience, clara sentience, empathy, all of those things. So I just put that out and there's a... Uh, a last minute feature that I just got back yesterday that I didn't think was going to come through. I actually got a feature that we've been working to trying to get this to happen for a long time now, but uh, uh, better late than never. But I got a feature back from Beast1333 that's going to be posted uh, on Patreon as well, probably this evening. So if you want to hear that feature, it's um, what song is it? It's Visions featuring Beast1333 and myself. That will be available tonight patreon.com backslash truth seeker there you get access to all that stuff even our thursday night school of the mystics we're doing that sunday morning sierra class bunch of cool stuff head on over there check it out all that cool stuff shout out to illuminous who just donated ten ten dollars through snap, uh super chat you're awesome thank you so much for that so that's out the way without further ado i'm going to go ahead and bring on today's guest jill Thomas, Jill, welcome to the Truth Seeker Podcast. How are you, my friend? Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I love talking about this stuff. Thank you so much. This is an amazing show. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about a lot of cool stuff. Um, we're gonna talk about hypnotherapy. That's what you do. Um, yes. Past life regression. I will say I'm still a skeptic. I want to believe, but I am still a skeptic. So I want to talk to, talk to you about it a little bit. And uh, and you also mentioned UFOs and aliens and things. So we'll talk about that as, as well. So I guess to kind of get started, just kind of give the people uh, a little bit. I think I heard the word. Let's get started. Let's get started. Yeah. Let's. Uh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's give the people a little bit of uh, you know background about who you are, what you bring to the table. And uh, yeah, the internet is being silly, but yeah. Who are you and what do you bring to the table, Joe? 
I'm a hypnotherapist. I've been doing this for 15 years. Uh, I started off as just a hobbyist. I enjoyed uh, making all of my friends have better golf games, helping them with past life regressions, um, getting past fears and phobias. And then someday somebody said, you know, people will give you money for this. And I'm like, really? I'm in this miserable job that I absolutely hate. And I could just like do that and people give me money and that's way more fun. So then I started this as a career. And it's just it's just been an amazing journey. You'd be surprised when you see clients how much you clients. You learn so much from every single person that walks through the door. It's helped helped me grow as a person tremendously. So if you've ever been in the place of considering a profession like this, I would encourage you to do it because you don't realize how much growth happens when you're helping other people. It, you, you think it's about them, but it's not. It ends up being about you. It's just so much fun. But I started off as a sales rep for a software company. I was selling all kinds of things. I've even sold Kirby vacuum cleaners. <laughs> listening can relate to that. Also, a whole new level of misery. But uh, I used a lot of those skills that I learned, believe it or not, in sales, not to sell people on hypnotherapy. If they want it, great. If they don't, that's fine, too. But it's more understanding why people do the things they do and also being able to hear when people are lying to themselves. When you're in sales, particularly when you're on the phone all day long, and I'm sure some people listening can relate to this, you start to hear BS pretty loudly. <laughs> you know? And it, it starts to become very clear because people's voices actually change when they're lying to you. And, they, and they're a little different when they're lying to themselves, too. And that's the part that's interesting because most people don't catch that right away. And that's why it's so helpful to have somebody who's a hypnotherapist or a guide or a coach that you're working with because you can, they can hear it. I can hear it. Somebody's voice changes a lot when the person's lying to themselves. And so part of my journey is helping people understand themselves better so that they can heal the things that are broken or that are not working in their lives. So they can have the things they really want. And it's all about being happy and having joy and having fun. And I help people find that joy and that fun again. Got so many questions just out of that. I want to try to uh, stay on okay. topic first, but there's some good stuff there. Um, I want to ask you just about that place of desperation, you know, doing something that seemed brand new, exciting and fun uh, that people told you that you can do it for a living and get paid. I was in a yeah. very s similar spot, right? I was went to see uh, m my first, uh, you know, Reiki practitioner and got to lead us into trance state and move energy around and feel great and she makes a she wakes up and does that for a living and i was like man i was so envious um and i wanted to know how i could do it you know and but from that place of starting out there to being stuck at that dead end job loathing what you do and seeing this person that you want to be like and and like the journey about bringing it into manifestation where were you at in that journey of like how do I make this happen? Maybe I have to lower my cost of living because it's not going to pay as much at, at first or something like that. What was that journey like? Uh, I will tell you, going from being an employee to being a business owner is a very different mindset. And I think that's the part people don't realize. If you've never had a family member who owned a business, you might not even know how you get started. I mean, you know, I had to find out that you had to go buy a business, get a business license. I had to find out I had to register with the county. Uh, the particular city I'm in has some very lenient rules, but the city I was in didn't. So I had to actually had to move my business to another city. And so all of those little things that that are difficult at first, if you just don't know what to do. I know it sounds odd, but those are the things that trip people up. I hear all the time from clients. I didn't know where to start. I couldn't figure out how to what to name my business. I didn't know what to do. Um, personally, I don't like the idea of having to live in my car. So I kept my j day job while I built my business. Because when you start a business, as you know, it takes a long time for you to start getting money, <laughs> yeah. regular money from yeah. that business before it can start paying you. And I personally did not want to put that kind of pressure on myself. And I, I like having a new car every few years. I like having food. So I kept my day job until my business started to put, support me. And it really did take a few years, I want to say, four or five years before it really started to, to pay enough to where I didn't have to have that day job at all. But, you know, don't put that kind of pressure on yourself. Let yourself keep the what I call the bill payer, do the bill payer for a little while and grow the business because it does take, it does take time. But I will say that the, the skill of owning a business and being a business owner is very different than the skill of, of being able to do the Reiki and the hypnotherapy. And in order to do this successfully, you have to be able to do both. So I know it's tough. I'm a great hypnotherapist. I'm not always the best business owner. And I had to learn how to be a better business owner so that I could always have the bills paid so that I can always have 
you know, clients coming in. If you can get somebody who can help you, particularly if you have a friend, maybe they're not so expensive, then, then you can get, get things rolling more quickly. But there's a very different mindset between the healer part, which is in some ways like missionary work. It can feel yeah. a little bit like missionary work yeah. to you being somebody who has to be able to, to make that rent every month and have an office in a nice part of town so that your clients feel safe and being able to have things set up so that it's easy for you to get and, and experience clients. Um, in terms of pricing, I would say, you know, a lot of times people screw up and they start charging. They think I should just charge less when I first start so I can get it rolling. And yeah, that's somewhat true, but you don't want to go down the, the rabbit hole of being the, the cheapest name in the town. You know, you don't want to be the race to the bottom of pricing. We, when you offer healing services, particularly Reiki, like you said, you don't, you don't want to be the Walmart of pricing. You want to be, <laughs> you want to have better skills, but, and you want to start to grow your business, but you really just don't want to start with, Hey, I'm going to charge nothing or almost nothing. And I'll get a lot of clients. Cause that's not what happens. What ends up happening is when you charge too little, like 20 bucks an hour, which is ridiculously low, but I've seen that. Uh, if you charge 20 bucks an hour, then you get people who are only willing to pay 20 bucks an hour. Yeah, and that's true. that there's an investment, there's an exchange. When you're healing, there's an exchange required. Uh, the universe wants something in exchange. So somebody gives me $100, I help them with their baggage. But that money is going to me, I'm receiving it, but the universe is actually receiving it. It's the, it's the energy of the flow. And so when you're telling somebody, I'm only worth this, you're saying that your problem is only 20 yeah, bucks, but it's exactly. not. Yeah. Got to think bigger, if that makes sense. Oh, for sure. Um, so you actually have a, a, um, a building, right? That you, you see, see people in, in person versus yes. just over the internet, right? I do both. I do both. But yeah, I have an office in Encinitas, California. Cool, cool. Um, in, in your bio, it says that you're a clairvoyant reader as well. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, when, when people are lying to you that their voices change and you can tell when people are lying. And I, I, I say little things like that. You always know this, that people know this. You can tell this. Not everybody can tell. Like a, not everybody can tell when someone's lying. I wonder if it's th that you do pay attention to the voice change or is it part of that spiritual gift that you're able to kind of read the intention behind their vibration, behind their voice, you know, as as being a clairvoyant or being empathic. You can tell when someone's lying. You can tell when someone isn't telling the truth or someone has ill intentions towards you or something like that. Do you think that those kind of go hand in hand as far as being able to tell when someone's lying or not telling the truth? It's, it's both. Um, their voice definitely changes. There's no question of that. I, I don't think you have to be psychic to hear it sometimes. Um, but it goes both ways. I will tell you it's harder when somebody is, and I have run across clients who are sociopaths, um, and this is rare. So don't freak out and worry that, that one of these is going to show up at your door. This is really quite rare. But when they're sociopath, I will tell you as, a, as an intuitive, and this is how it feels for me, is it feels like a neutral. Like um, when I'm talking to you, I can feel your vibration. I can hear, you know, we're kind of tuned into each other. But when it's sociopath or a psychopath, and I, I assume I haven't had a psychopath yet, <laughs> um, it feels very neutral. And when that person shows up, I get nervous. Um because that person isn't isn't in touch with their emotions and they're they don't uh, feel things in the same way, um, but you know I can hear it I can feel it when somebody's is lying to themselves but there's definitely something in the voice it's hard to separate because I always do both so I can't tell which is which is the intuition and which is the vibrational change of the voice yeah but there there is definitely something in the voice and I'm sure that there are a lot of people listening who particularly if you've ever done phone sales because you only when you're on the phone it's like your your eyesight's restricted you don't see body language you don't see what they're wearing you're only hearing that voice and it yeah. definitely changes and it shifts um, and, and there's, and that's not something somebody can try and cover up. I've had plenty of clients try to lie to me. I'm not cheating on my wife, but she thinks I am. How do I make her think I'm not cheating? Oh, that shows up a lot, by the way. And I could totally tell they're lying, but they can't cover it up in their voice, but they can cover it up in their body language a little bit. It's just stuff that you pick up, but yeah, there's definitely a vibration and it's tough when you are naturally intuitive to separate what's, what's this and what's that. Does that make sense? Yeah, the, I think the phone call thing is, is interesting as well, dealing with people over the phone because like, in like, because even this morning I had to call the internet company and try to get a credit and I'm complaining about my, my bill and my service being in and out all the time and, 
and I know they've heard it all before. And I'm trying to get a credit. They won't give me a credit. And I'm trying to complain in my, and I get kind of, but I don't want to. I'm having to like, I'm not the one who's complaining. I need to, you know, try to be stern to get a credit with my bill. They wasn't having it. But I can even tell in my own inflection of my voice is like, I don't even want to ask you for this, but this is what I kind of got to go through the motions to try to at least get a credit. And, uh, you know, they, they, they read voices all the time. They can tell when, when that stuff happens and voices change and stuff. So it's really interesting to to pay attention to um, whether it, it is something that's spiritual or something that you're picking up that's physical or a little bit of both. I think it's somewhere in, in, in the middle. There's like, you know, personas, the way people carry themselves, the way they talk, the way they move, body language. Some of that stuff it, we learn, but it still ties back into the personification of, you know, the, the spiritual essence of that person or what they're involved with even. Like someone who is cheating, they're going to try to always put the blame on someone else or whatever the case is. And so you kind of learn that 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 stuff as well, right? Yeah. And, you know, there was something you just said that I want to I want to go back to is and this is a classic healer thing. I don't want to I don't want to have to ask for this thing because I don't want to hurt your feelings. You're saying this to whatever. I'm assuming it was like cops yeah. or something. Yeah. And you, you in, empathize with the person who's on the phone with you and you're the healer doesn't want to have to say. <laughs> but then the business owner has to say, look, I'm running a business here. Yeah. And if my Internet's down, I lose money. I require a credit. Yeah. So that's where you have to be able to balance those two skills. You don't have to be a jerk about it. I mean, I know you weren't, but you, you do have to be able to say, I have a business. Business requires this thing to be working. And if it's not, I need compensation for what I lost. Yeah. So can you kind of kind of hear in that? Yeah. And I, di- I didn't want to. And because in, in the whole thing is like I've been through <laughs> I've been through this. I know what they're going to say. We're going to schedule a maintenance guy to come out here. The maintenance guy comes out, can't find anything wrong. And it's just like, man, just over and over and over. And even when I, I'm sorry to put my internet problems out there, but it's a big deal, right? Even like the stream's kind of acting silly right now. But um, when I tell them I, I have a business and I'm losing money, they say, well, we have a business plan and that internet's $350 a month, but you get a dedicated line. I'm like, $350, Three hundred fifty dollars. You know, there's no way, no way I could do that. But anyway, you have to kind of play those roles, even if you don't want to. And uh, we had a, a comment here in the chat. Gabriel Kraft uh, says it's unnatural to lie. That's why the body reacts in a negative way because you're going against what the the body wants to do. But you ha- also have those people who that's all they do is lie. Like I've had some friends, they, they lie about stuff they don't need to lie about, you know, asking them, have they ever seen a movie, a certain movie? Oh, but yeah, I don't want to watch it. I've seen that movie seven times. Okay. Well, what is it? You know, what's it about? And they can't tell you what it's about. It's like, and I've met other people who meet strangers and, and tell them they own businesses and, they get their phone numbers even, and just like, Hey, I own a business and I'll I'll make something. And then we walk away. I'm like, you don't, you don't own a business. What was that about? Just these weird, whether that's part of the sociopath as well, but it's really strange when, when people do that, you know, to try to present themselves in a certain type of light or whatever. Well, and I'm not going to be a saint here and pretend that everyone else is a sinner. I've done it too. And we've all done it. I mean, we lie about human beings. We lie about stupid stuff. I like, it's an interesting concept to think that it's not natural to lie. I'm not sure. I mean, I feel like this thing that we do, every one of us do it does at least 10 times a day on average. I'm not sure that that's unnatural, but it's an interesting concept that to think that if it is unnatural, that would explain how the body language and the voice is different. Gabriel, you're making me think. You're making me think. I like this. But uh, yeah, I, we all do it. I mean, we lie about stupid stuff. We, it's all about impression management. I want to put a certain persona off to the world. I want to present myself as being more affluent than I probably am. I want want things to be presented in a certain way because I want a certain image, particularly if you're trying to promote a book or anything, you want people to think you're more amazingly popular than you really are. And you want, you know, the book is great. It's a wonderful thing, but you want everybody to hear your best foot forward. So yeah, we do lie all the time. Everybody does it. I'm telling you, everybody. Exaggerating stories, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. How long was that? How big was that fish you caught? Yes, we all do it. 
I, I, I try to check myself on that and then, you know, to make sure that I don't do that. Because I got some pretty crazy stories. Again, we're talking about the spirit realm and spiritualities and aliens and, and stuff like that. Like, but what is that, though, like to to step into that realm of the unknown, even for the first time, to want to check yourself? Like, how was that for you? You know, I love to talk to people about when they first got started, if you had experiences as a little kid and, you know, you oh, have this yeah. this one time experience that stays with you your whole life and it, it changes the course of your destiny because you get into maybe the paranormal or listening to podcasts such as this one because you had an encounter with a ghost because you feel a certain type of way when you bump shoulders with strangers in Walmart, you can, you know what they're thinking. How was it like that for you just starting out with this spirituality and things like that as a child? Yeah, I was really young uh, when I first started seeing people who didn't have bodies. I hate to say, you know, dead people because they, they're not really dead. They just don't have a body anymore. Um, my, one of my, the mem I love the way you described it. One of the memories that really stuck with me that, that kind of influenced me a great deal was when I was maybe four or five, I saw my grandfather and then there was a woman behind him who wanted me to tell him that she was really sorry that he had to be raised by these awful people, that it wasn't her plan. And so I'm telling my grandfather this, and this is a family secret. I didn't know that everyone didn't know the woman that raised him was not his biological mother, was his, actually his grandmother, but that, that kind of came out later. But I got backhanded and thrown mm. against a wall because in my very conservative Christian family, that kind of thing was not okay. That was, in, and he was yelling at me that witches get burned at the stake. You don't want to be a witch. And I remembered like, oh my God, what is this thing? I, you know, I'm, I, this woman is behind. I can see her just as clearly as I can see him, but I knew she didn't have a body anymore. That was pretty obvious to me. But, you know, I remember when that happened, I kind of shut it down. Well, if, if this is a bad thing, why would I want to be and do something bad, especially if there's violence involved? So for me, it took a long time to sort of open it up again. I was always kind of seeing dead people and I was always kind of getting intuitive information, but that really shut it down. It was only when I was a teenager, when I started to feel more comfortable with my spirituality, that I started to let it come back in. And I remember like praying, okay, guys, you know, I know when I was four, I said, I didn't want this, but I changed my mind. Can I have it back now? <laughs> And so it started to come back, especially when I did more meditation and I started taking classes, particularly in uh, mediumship and also channeling, which is an amazing one. I think everyone should take training and channeling. It's just because it's not that hard and it sounds weird, but it's really not. And I really recommend those kinds of things. But, you know, I to me, it never really seemed weird to see people who didn't have bodies. It never really seemed weird to under to know the backstory behind things and to know that people were lying to me because I always I always did. Uh, I know people have these great stories where these near death experiences where they awaken and suddenly see angels. I didn't have any of that. I sort of always had something my whole life. So I don't have that great big event. You know, there was lots of little events. And for me, it was all about being comfortable with being different. It was all about being comfortable knowing things that I wasn't supposed to know. And that has kind of been my journey is feeling comfortable with myself and feeling safe. I mean, I know a lot of people listening who are healers don't feel safe telling people, you know what, that thing where I, you say, you always seem to know stuff and I pretend that I don't know. Well, I kind of do. And it's because you're, it's in your aura or something. <laughs> you, know? you have to get more and more comfortable with that aspect of your own pers personality. And that does take time. I will say. Yeah, that's uh. You know, that could be a hard one, just coming into the gifts and figuring out what it is and how to use it and and then learning etiquette with it, learning when because, you know, things about people that nobody else knows, you know, and uh, when do you speak that? Do you speak it in a group? Do you pull them aside in private because it's, you know, controversial, you know, uh, and, and so there, there's just learning what that is and, and walking in it and using it. Um takes a lot of time, a lot of practice and a, a lot of I love that you to. bring that up though, because people don't think about that. It is not appropriate to say to somebody, Hey, your dead grandma's standing behind you and she wants you to know that the dog's okay. I yeah. mean, that's not okay. Unless they've asked you, you can really freak someone out that yeah. way. I, I hate seeing like those medium shows on TV, which we know are staged, but <laughs> it makes it look like they just went up to some random person in the butcher shop and told them yeah. about their dead grandma. Yeah. That's not in real life. That's not okay. Even with clients, when I, they come in for hypnotherapy and I can see stuff in their aura that something's going to happen or they're going to get pregnant soon. Unless I know that it's okay. They're not, if, unless they're there for a reading, 
we're talking about hypnotherapy and that's it. And that's hard for me because I want to, but you know, and I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to tune in to, to things that are not part of the scope of what we're talking about because people are entitled to their privacy just like I am. And it's not really okay for me to read everybody on the street. Uh, and also I would be really tired if I did that, <laughs> but you I love that you bring that up because it is something I think that's the, the lesson a lot of healers have to know is when is it okay to say something and you you know, sometimes it's okay to say something to a good friend if, if you know that they're open to it. But in general, it isn't okay to just go up to a random stranger and tell them stuff. It's not, that's not cool. Yeah. Um, it could be very, um, I think the, the information that comes through can be very personal and you got to find the etiquette, like, like really deep stuff, you know, someone going outside of their marriage. Do you call them out in front of their spouse? Like, you know, like, do you even bring it to them? Do you keep it to yourself and say, you know what? Let me move to the next one, you know, all this kind of stuff. And you pick up all of these things and um, just learning etiquette to do it. And even in the church, right? So this is where I kind of got into the, the spiritual giftings was in the church. And we would pray for people and you would be able to pick up impressions off of them about what they were going through. You may feel a pain in your body if an ailment that they were dealing with or whatever. And it's like how long that was I encountering that and experiencing that with people before I said, hey, what's this about your neck being in pain or whatever the case is, or, you know, what's this about someone who can't hear out of their left ear being in services and stuff with people. And I would go deaf in, a ear, in my ear and not knowing what it was. I didn't already say oh, it's a spirit or it's God letting me know that someone needs their ear open for in prayer and things like that. So trying to figure out and navigate through this stuff. That's why podcasts like this and the work that you're doing, your books and everything, are very important to take some of the, I don't know if we want to, you know, you know, spookiness off of it, some of the Hollywood off of it, even, you know, because it is, it, it really does happen more natural than, you know, like in Hollywood, a spirit appearing and whispering in your ear, like on some of the television shows. Some it, sometimes it's just it works through your imagination. You see that person, a random thought pops in your head that there's no way you would have thought that. And it takes it a little bit further and, and deeper. And it's like, okay, now what I do it do with this? Do I ask them about it or, or what? So what were some of the things that just starting out? Obviously, you had, you know, something that happened when, when, whenever you were young that caused you to turn it off, right? That That's what happens with most of us. We take our visions, we tell it to people and, and they don't agree with it. Or, you know, in the Bible, Jesus says, don't throw your... Uh, pearls before swine. You start running around telling everybody you're a clairvoyant, you're an empath, and they they laugh or they don't believe you, and it kind of hurts you. You you're looking for some type of edification and gratification in it, but nobody knows what that looks like, right? And how practical it really is. So, what were some more of the things for you that just got you to really step out and know that something was going on? Was it just that one that one instance that you knew from that point, or was it like you know, because when you when you have those feelings and you get those thoughts and impressions, when someone responds or breaks down in tears, whether you say, hey, hey, who is so and so? And you just mention the name and it's some it's someone who maybe just passed away or whatever the case is. And they break down in tears and it confirm it builds your faith. Really, it confirms something within you uh, that, hey, there's something more to this to pursue. The next time I get this impression, I'm going to do it again. And you start building your faith and stepping out for bigger, bigger, bigger things and things like that. So eventually you're able to do it full time. Right. What were, what were some more stories like that for you that just kind of built your faith growing up? Oh, when I was maybe 10, we my family owned a chain of grocery stores in Arkansas. And at one point we had an employee who was stealing. And I remember like standing next to him and I said to my dad, this guy's stealing from us. And no, you're wrong. What evidence do you have? And I kept hearing, like, for me, a lot of it was unlearning the things that my parents said or that my family said, because they were not comfortable with my clairvoyance, my talking to dead people thing at all. But it turned out he was stealing. He had stolen a crazy amount of money. And um, I, I never got validation from my family. Never everybody said I was right. But it started to get me thinking, you know, sometimes maybe I am right and it is okay. Um, but I, I love the example you gave about praying in church and having a chance to, to tune into a person intuitively. Imagine if you'd been in a class where it would have been safe exactly. for you to say to that person, I hear this thing with your ear. And then you could learn, OK, when when spirit is showing me an ear that's dead, it means this. 
Because what if it wasn't exactly that their ear canal was closed? Yeah. Maybe it's that they're not hearing intuitive thoughts yeah. or they're not hearing. If you'd been able to get some validation or some back and forth, that would have been very helpful. That's why I always tell people it's really good to get training, even if you think you don't need it. I mean, I don't mean how many intuitives say, I am naturally intuitive, like it's this badge of honor, and that's great. <laughs> but yeah, I'd be naturally intuitive, but go to class. Because yeah. then you learn who's not your client. You learn the rules. You get feedback. Um, I love it when I went to a mediumship class. I took James Von Prague's mediumship class. It was just amazing. And it was good to hear you're wrong, but you're not completely wrong. It's actually this thing. Yeah. And I could see the symbols that spirit would show me. Um, but I had lots of lots of incidents like that where I would say secrets I would, I asked the guy, I remember asking somebody, a friend once, when, you, when is it you guys are moving? I see you moving in a couple of weeks. And he, and then he starts the same thing. They start crying and it, it takes you a minute to realize, wait, if somebody's crying, maybe I shouldn't have said that. You know, that's when you, that's when taking a class, it also helps you learn the etiquette of it. That can be helpful. And sometimes it isn't helpful because maybe that was a, a, a private thing. They weren't ready to quite talk about. What if, uh, and it, it loved your example, back to the ear thing. What if that pain they were feeling in their side was something private that they didn't want to talk about, like a hiatal, hiatal hernia or something really secret, private medical thing mm. that you wouldn't necessarily want to say out loud? Yeah. Um, you you have to learn how to to read when it is appropriate to do it or not. That, but that's the thing I love about class, though, is because that's a safe space to say, no, you're wrong. Yes, you're right. To get the validation and to start to feel out what does right feel like and what does wrong feel like. Yeah. Because I will tell you, intuitive messages tend to come and they're much more quiet. They're not full of a lot of emotion. Yeah. So with an, I, I remember a story when I was driving one time, I was watching, it was raining, and I was watching somebody drive crazy. And I thought, okay, I, I heard in the, the voice very clearly outside of my ear, actually. Usually it's inside my head, but this one was outside my ear. The voice said, this person's going to have an accident. They're going to hit the car behind them and they're going to spin. And so I glance over to see what exit I'm near. I've got 911 on the phone before the accidents even happened. And I've moved over to the other lane and I've got them on their way before, you know, before I can really react. And it was only later when I started crying because I thought, I realized I probably just saw somebody die because it was a really bad accident. And, but it, in the initial moment, it's this quiet knowing. Yeah. It's later that we attach the emotion to it. So I always tell people if you're, if you're scared, if you're feeling really scared, like your house is about to explode, <laughs> that may not be intuition. That may just be your own fears yeah. because intuition <laughs> is much quieter than that. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It usually doesn't yell like you're saying. It's usually like those yell. Cause that's what I was going to ask you. Like sometimes we get these crazy fears that we're about to get in a wreck and you wonder if it's a premonition or it's just your mind playing tricks on you or whatever the case is and so you're always like going back and forth to weigh the information uh with this discernment like what is from me what is my overactive imagination and what is me uh, picking up impressions about things that are about to happen and um, that that's a journey in and of itself and wanting to step out to see if you're right or whatever the case is. But, you know, learning and growing in a safe environment is is key for people who are who are having this, you know, what I'm saying phenomena happen to them. Um, that That's how I learned. We learned in, uh, in in certain church services and then small groups that we would go to that practiced it. And we would get off in, into pairs and, and pair up and we would sit until we got a word for somebody even if it was just an encouraging message to help them and so that's how i learned and then we're doing that even with our our, our, our members and stuff on thursday nights we'll break we'll break down into groups and teach them how to do it and it's it, very interesting is like some of the breakthroughs people have had for their first time just stepping out you know most of the people who are listening to podcasts like this and who are into your work even the people who book private sessions with me for the most part they've been people who are called to be healers themselves but they just have to get over these hurdles and want to know what it looks like and things like that so being able to to do sessions with these people or even like a small group they pick it up they just never been facilitated and say hey this is what it looks like maybe try this and it's so insane to see the people starting out for the first time giving someone a word and then them just break down into tears for the first time and that's like like healing tears you know that's like validation of just speaking it out 
and then ministering healing to it and saying that it's okay, speaking healing, blessing, blessing them through prayer and things like that. Growing in small group and community, like you said, I, don't, I wouldn't know how I'd be so, so confused, man, if it wasn't for that you know, th- those times and then listening to podcast as well, because there was maybe even some deeper things that I got into that I probably couldn't talk to those people about, you know, that I needed someone to talk to who, who's been through it. So that's what's so important about coming out and being OK with who you are. You know, if you come from a, a long family of, of, of Christians and you say, well, I see dead people. You no, know, we're praying against it. I mean, that's what happened to me in church. I was trying to tell the pastors I was having all these premonitions about, you know, things that were going to happen to the church and the people in the church. And they were like rebuking it like it was the devil and told me not to entertain it. And it was stuff that just when it started happening and came to pass, I was like, OK, there's something to this, you know. Yeah. And, and there was something you just said earlier that I want to go back to. Um you spirit guide spirit guides are, are frequently the ones that bring us these messages this information spirit guides having done a lot of uh, channeling with clients with spirit guides they are, do not speak in essays they usually just give you a couple of words spirit guide information <laughs> yeah. is usually like a, a five word ten word bit of wisdom they yeah. don't take the time to tell you a whole essay unless they're channeling a, a blog or yeah. something like that but I, you know, I love what you said about the other thing I want to go back to is that I, I do like to clarify with with Christianity. I think Christianity is a beautiful face, but it's, I think that Christ himself would never say, don't talk to dead people. If he was here, he'd be screaming that that's not true. It's the religions themselves that create this whole you know facade around it and, and turn, you know, a beautiful being with lots of beautiful messages of love and light into something that we should be afraid of and and make the devil out of phenomenon and spiritual enlightenment. But, but I love Christianity itself. Like Christ consciousness is so beautiful. And I would love to see religion, you know, sort of separate out the religion part of it from the spiritual part of it and have, cause it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. If you're listening and you're a, a devout Christian, devout Christian, you can still talk to dead people. You can still do those beautiful things. It just goes against the beliefs that you may have been indoctrinated, but it's, it's this part of growing up is starting to wonder what's true and what's really not what's true for me and what's really not true for me. And that's, that's part of becoming a human being and growing at a deeper level is questioning all of those things. Don't, don't you constantly question everything you see in your life now? It's crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> and the, the cool thing is there's a lot of Christians who are getting into this, you know, they're, they're kind of returning to the roots of their faith and they're seeing Jesus, you know, meeting with Moses and Elijah at, on the top of a mountain who died, you know, hundreds of years before he was here, you know, who went on into eternity, but they're teaching him from beyond the grave, you know? And so we, uh, you know, and it gets into, you know, our ancestors contacting us and watching over. So there's like a lot of that stuff we've studied that's been in the scriptures the whole time. It's, it has nothing to do with Western evangelicalism. It looks more like Eastern thought. Christianity originally came out of the East and it's littered with supernatural and paranormal experiences and things, ghosts and all of that stuff's in there in a positive light. So that's the work that I do is try to shed light on that stuff. And there's a lot of pe- people who are, um, you know, trying to make sense about what they're feeling. And, and you don't have to abandon your faith. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to abandon Jesus or your love for Christ uh, because you're having these in- encounters and experiences and stuff. It's really interesting. Um, when it comes to um, healing, right, and these people who were coming to us, again, I, I received a revelation some years ago from, from God. It was heal the healers. And that's just yeah. been my thing on my, my, and, and I, our, I mean, it's most of us, right? Anybody who's been through something, you have a natural empathy to help people. So most of us have been through something and we want to help people heal. So most of the people that I, I deal with, they're healers themselves, but they have to get over their obstacles. I had to do, I had to do my own inner healing before I could step out and not be triggered and not get upset or lash out or whatever the case is, you know? Um, so what, what, what have you seen as far as people coming to you who are called to do the similar work as well? Is it a lot of people? For me, it's almost everyone. Do you see that as well? Or is it just, yeah, a, I, or is it just some of everybody who comes too? you know? 
I mean, I do get, I do get a, you know, a lot of everyone, but mm. I, I will say right now, especially I'm getting a lot more healers uh, coming in and th- I love what you just described. We all have experienced something. I firmly believe that healers are not born. I believe that they're created. And I, fortunately, years ago, I actually used to work at a hormone research laboratory and we were researching uh, testosterone and different hormones on the body. And one of my teachers, one of the, the people in charge of research, whenever we'd see somebody with really high testosterone, I asked him, what does this mean? And he said, oh, it just means that when they were a child, there was violence in the home. And then I, for some reason, that ding, ding, ding went in my head when I, when I would see someone with a really high testosterone on their lab report, I would ask them about violence in their home. And then I would also ask them about if they were intuitive. And nine times out of 10, they would say, yeah, I kind of am, but I don't really talk about it. And I I started to develop this theory that people who experience violence, disharmony, um, difficult things in their early childhood, turn their intuition on to full blast and they turn their uh, testosterone up just to actually make them feel safer. It's just because it's this aggressive hormone that helps you feel safer. But I've noticed that over the years that when you're talking to somebody who is a healer, they always have had something really nasty happen when they were younger that caused them to turn their intuition on to full blast so that they could figure out if they were safe when they were going into a home. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Somebody who had a father who was violent, you had to be able to feel out a room before you walked into it to know if you were safe or not. So imagine a two-year-old turn their intuition on full blast to feel out dad's vibe to get his feeling and now fast forward 20 years later they're 22 and they're still using that intuition they're still feeling the entire room to determine if it's safe now first of all that's going to give them anxiety disorder which is another reason i see a lot of these healers i see a lot of healers for anxiety disorder but it also makes you open to un- to the vibrational frequencies of the room so in a way that's how we're created by bad things happening yeah. as a kid because we have to learn how to be able to feel the vibes in the room, read people to know if we're safe. Yeah. And it can be difficult as an adult because that same person goes into the grocery store and they're reading everybody in the room. And that's why they're getting anxiety because they, they haven't learned how to turn it off or wow. how to, to selectively listen. Yeah. You know, you want to know if the date that you're, you're uh, with is planning on doing violence to you, but you don't need to know if the person standing next to you at Vons or the grocery store is, is having a bad day or not. That doesn't need to be any of your business, but that's one of the things that healers getting training is very, very helpful. But yes, probably 80% of my clients right now are healers in training. Yeah. So that's interesting. You uh, link, you kind of link the empathy with anxiety you know, and there's all these memes, and we 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 all joke about it. Um, hold on, we 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 all, we all joke about it, uh, talking about um, how healers and em- empaths can't go to Walmart because they're picking up on all the energies, yep. and uh, and you're just kind of like getting beat up by them. You know, and the the <laughs> everybody, not just one or two people who need a message, but every single person, and it turns into anxiety. And then you can't look the people in the face because you have all of this stuff going on because you've learned to, like you said, read the room and and know those people groups. And you're you're reading everybody, what type of persona they have, what spirits are on them, ancestry, you know, lineage, all types of things. And you're just trying to go get a gallon of milk, you know, and you're having to put up with all that stuff. So being able to maybe heal from it or just learning to turn it off and on and only I think some of the stronger ones tend to come through, like some of the more powerful encounters that 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 people who really need help or something would would still come through. But like, how how do we we kind of turn it off, but not like all the way? Is it do we turn it off and on, as some people say, or how does that work? Because it's very overwhelming for a lot of people, you know. I- you're absolutely right. And this is why I always tell people healers get with other healers because we learn tricks and tools. Um, personally, I kind of imagine a, a, like a raincoat. If you're if you're wearing a raincoat, you still going to know it's raining, but you're not going to get wet. Um, I actually work a lot with my own spirit guides and I ask them to not let people, other beings bother me. And if, unless somebody's dead grandma is really intense and that has happened, it is hard for a spirit to pester me when I'm not on duty. Um, and I, because I also, I, I have to think about for myself, I think of it as somebody's privacy. I value my privacy. If I'm at the Walmart and I'm reading somebody, I'm invading their privacy. And I, I have to remind myself of that partly because it really isn't any of my business if 
what's going on in their life. You know, unless they've asked me or made an appointment and given me money as part of the exchange, then it isn't any of my business. I always just sort of imagine the raincoat. Other thing I will do is I'll imagine their energy going to the earth and asking mother, mother to recycle it into love. Um, but you, you do kind of learn how to, to, I don't like the word shielding because it ends up, a shield ends up becoming a barrier, which becomes a thing. And we, we want to let people's energy go past us and into the earth, but, uh, you know, or sometimes I'll imagine a raincoat with, with lots of light around it. That's beautiful. So there is this reflecting, they imagine love, feeling love, but I know what people are going through that, that overwhelming anxiety of being in a public place. I will say that ends up becoming an impediment and you end up being coming almost handicapped if you don't seek some help for that. Uh, I will say with hypnotherapy, that's one of the easier things to resolve is just sort of turning down the volume on the anxiety. It doesn't mean you're turning it off. If somebody wishes you ill, you're still going to know because your spirit guides are going to slam you on your shoulder as well as your dead relatives are going to let you know if somebody's going to hurt you. But to be able to go into the grocery store and function or go to a baseball game and not freak out, that's a big part of just living life. And yeah. that's one of the things that that training will help you with. But I know I know what these people are going through. And personally, I hate the word sensitive. I hate that freaking word. I hate when we call it sensitive person syndrome because they're not sensitive. They're intuitive. They're picking up other people's things. That word sensitive, I know it's semantics, but to me it sounds, it implies weakness. It's not weakness. It's a strength. It's just, it's the gift and the curse. A lot of people going to the grocery store being overwhelmed, they're feeling the curse. But the gift is that when somebody comes to them and they become a healer and they're doing an exchange, they're able to give useful healing information and healing light to that person. That's the gift. But the curse is, can be hard to just do ordinary things sometimes without training, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, if that's not dealt with, someone who is intuitive and dealing with anxiety can it lead to mental disorders such as schizophrenia? And if so, have you seen people be healed of that? I, as a hypnotherapist, I'm not really allowed to work with schizophrenics, so I don't work with them. I don't know that much. Of, as a result, I don't know that much about that. Um, I'm not sure that anxiety necessarily leads to schizophrenia. I will say that anxiety can lead to other illnesses yeah. because I have seen that. I've seen people get really sick. Um, and, and have nervous breakdowns and things like that. Yeah. I don't know about the mental illness of schizophrenia because there there is a physical component to that as well. There are a lot of healers though, and, and I'm not sure where I sit in this. There's a lot of healers that don't believe there really is schizophrenia, that that yeah. is just be people being able to talk to dead people or people hearing voices yeah. from others from the other side. And that may very well be the case. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I know with some things like bipolar disorder, they have actually found some chemical imbalances that, that seem to cause that problem or make that problem worse. Mm -hmm. um, but that's another thing I can't work with clients on, so I, I don't know a lot about it. But yeah. I, I will say that there's more going on than, than they're telling us. And I, if somebody's telling you you need to take a drug, question that. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. I yeah. don't know. Play yeah, with that. I get, I get a lot of people reaching out to me who you can tell just by their conversation that you know, stuff's going on. Um, and, and it's almost, you know, nine times out of 10, they're dealing with, with spirituality as well. I've seen it in the church, even in the church. It's like, there's this weird, um, uh, breeding ground for people with who are delusional, you know, and they say, you know, I have, I have, I have one guy, he was, uh, and he's a good friend of mine. He holds his stuff together really good. He's a great guy, but just weird stuff comes by, like talking about getting cut, like demons flying by him, cut, cutting him in, in the head. He's asking us, have y'all been cut today? You know, talking about when we cast out demons that they fly by and cut you in the head. And I'm like, you just hear all, a lot of different weird stuff. And especially, I feel like when it's, when people are having those overwhelming encounters, what if it was, okay, what if the demon's flying by cutting you in the head? And then what if your grandmother's in the corner trying to correct you? And then the person behind you is nudging on your shirt trying to get your attention? Like, I think whether it's if we want to diagnose that as schizophrenia, that's very overwhelming. And we need help. And if you don't treat that, it will, you don't have to call it schizophrenia. It will drive you mad. It will drive you insane. So we had the, the work that we're doing is, is beautiful and it's much needed. And I, I say that because I've been through it, you know, and I have that empathy to reach out to those people because I've been there and it's very overwhelming not being able to turn it off or on and just kind of being bullied by 
everything. Um, I feel so sorry for those people because I, I've, that personally has never been my reality. I've always had barriers up between what's yeah. real, so supposedly what's here on the earth plane and what's on the other side. Um, I, but I, I feel for people that don't seem to have those barriers up as, as tightly as I do. I, I wish I knew how to help them. I really don't. But I, I see what you're talking about. They really suffer with living in the regular world because they, they don't know if the person sitting next to them in a car actually has a body or not. And well, yeah. I can, I'm pretty clear about whether they have a body or not. And I'm also not seeing necessarily dark things um, in people's auras. And I, when I, I get more of those kinds of clients, when I do psychic readings, I get people that I had a client once who said, who was telling me they were absolutely convinced they were dating a celebrity. And I Googled mm. a celebrity Jesus. Obviously they're not, they're not dating them. And I knew they weren't dating them, but it is like, Oh, what do you say to that? That's yeah. That's, yeah pretty that's, sure that's not happening. Yeah. I have to deal with that. And, <laughs> I'm, and I'm married with children, you know, and there's women who say they're dating me and they're not. I mean, the, and, 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 and let's get into this too. There's that, but they even, it gets into the past life stuff because they were, they were married to me in a past life as a god or a goddess or something and they and i am another god reincarnated and we were married and now they're here trying to work things out or something you know and my wife's received death threats from these oh, these people god. yeah and it's gotten really it's schizophrenia it's not good it's it's wrong it's sick that person is sick and needs help um and i've heard i've had these conversations with some of these people who have had past life regressions who come back with all of these crazy grandiose ideas they inbox me and tell me that they were my mother in a f former life and this lady says she's my lover and wants to rekindle things in another life it's crazy and i think a lot of it's you know people who are suffering from delusion what how do we make sense and what is the value that you bring to people who when you talk about path life regression, and I think some of this, maybe what I'm talking about is past life suggestions. I'm going to suggest to you who you were, or you can be whatever you feel like you were, whatever. Where does, where does that fit in and trying to make sense of all this stuff versus people taking it way left field, taking your money and telling you these grandiose stories that you were a king or a great magician, you know, in the 16th century and things like that. Um, it's kind of a joke in the hypnotherapy world. I think most people don't realize this. That whole idea of past life regression therapy is very controversial, by the way. Um, people who are mainstream hypnotherapists look down on people like me who do past life regressions because they think that we are polluting yeah. the well and making yeah. it all, taking away legitimate. And there's, and they're not entirely wrong. I will, I will admit that. Um, the joke is that everybody thinks they were either Cleopatra, Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. I, I get a lot of dudes thinking they were, um, oh, pharaohs, magicians heroes or that, magicians yeah. there's another one he was every time uh they have some special on the history channel about some genghis khan that's the one every <laughs> time they have a special on the history channel i get phone calls people saying they're convinced that they were one of these famous people it was genghis khan i loved that one because i got three dudes coming in who paid my fee to find convinced that they were him and they weren't, you know, they weren't, but you have to keep in mind that there's a lot of ego that goes involved there. If I'm yeah. telling myself that I was Cleopatra now me, who's kind of a small person in the world <laughs> gets to be goddess, right? That makes my ego soar. And if I'm a practitioner and, and maybe not scrupulous, I will gladly tell somebody, yeah, you were, you were a famous Pharaoh, whatever in a past life. And then they keep coming back to me because their ego loves that little stroking. That's one of the things where having somebody who's got a lot of training can be very helpful because it's easier to spot the ego. Um, Cleopatra had a huge entourage of people around her. Uh, Queen Elizabeth had a huge entourage of people. The person may not be completely off. They may have been connected with that queen <laughs> or that royalty at some point, yeah. but not necessarily the queen. And I'll be honest with you, I've never had Cleopatra or Elizabeth show up in my office, the least yeah. that I know of. So... It's a tough one. I always tell people when somebody comes in and I really feel like they're schizophrenic because there's an energy about it and I can't describe it any other way, but there's a vibe that just doesn't feel right. Um, schizophrenia, another one that's bipolar uh, when it feels off. I usually refer those out to somebody who has experience with that because I, I just don't. Yeah. And I know they need help. It's mm -hmm. tough, um, but there are plenty of unscrupulous 
you know, psychic readers who will do a past life reading, which is not a past life regression, which is just me telling you whatever you want to hear. Oh, in the 16th century, you were this, that, and the other thing, mm. rather than, than telling you what, what really is helpful. Mm. Because I will tell you when I actually do past life regressions, most of the time people, if they were famous, they don't necessarily get the name because in, on the spiritual side, that's not necessarily helpful. It's helpful to know you were burned at the stake. It's helpful to know that you had issues with money and you were worried about money. It's helpful to know that you starved to death. It is not helpful to know that you were, a, you, it's, it might be helpful to know you were a king, but it's not necessarily helpful to know which one because our ego is the one that says, well, I was that, I must be special. Yeah. Mm. We're all special, yeah. we're all special. And we're it's, all nobody, it's both. It, it's usually like people, <laughs> they, it's usually something that they want to be in this life that they're not. And it's like this automatic credibility. Well, you know, I was a king. I was a king in the 16th century. I might not be one right. today, but it's still in my blood. You know, it's still in my DNA. You hear things like that or the magician. It's usually what they want to be doing, but they're not. Um, and it's interesting, too, about the people who claim to be maybe these other people reincarnated. And so, like I said, the, the celebrities like I know whenever David Wilcock, who's brought a lot of great work to the table, came out saying that he was Edgar Casey, He caught a lot of flack and uh, people making fun of him. And it really kind of messed up his work a little bit. Uh, and he's tried to stay away from it, not bring it up, maybe delete that kind of those that material he had out. Um it's interesting too. I've, I've dealt with some groups who claim to be Jesus and the 12 disciples reincarnated. And there's different Christian groups who claim that, you know, this person is Jesus. That person is the apostle Paul. And then you got, you know, all of these people and then they find each other and they're all part of this little cult and they have conversations amongst one another, like reminiscent of, when they were in Jerusalem and 2000 years ago and you know, the most high brought us all back together for, for this great work. And it's not just one group. Like I've heard of a couple different groups and I've had clients come to me who will say, you know, I, I was studying under this guy who claims to be Jesus. And I kind of think he is, you know, and, and it's so weird uh, the scripture, but Jesus even told you there's going to be many people <laughs> who come and says, here I am, there I am, but don't believe them. When I come back, you're going to know it. You're not going to have to find it on a website or go s visit some guy in Brooklyn. You're going to know. Um, so that, that's, that's interesting when they, people want to be celebrities or give this instant credibility, my, um, scrutiny towards, some of the channeling and stuff like that. I actually put out a little mini documentary thing I made about how it kind of gives you instant credibility with there's like an, uh, a scapegoat there, you know, and even in the church where we're talking about like people who are moving in the prophetic and uh, um, whether even if there's no spirituality, maybe it's just the Bible and doctrines and things like that. And they, the instant credibility is God told me to tell you this. Oh, I didn't say it. God says it, whether that's in the church or whether that's, you know, with the channeling thing. I didn't say it. This is channeled from Ra. There's an instant credibility. You need to listen. Ra said this is the raw material or whatever. And so there, there's some scrutiny there. Um, what do you what do you think about that? That's definitely going on. But that in channeling celebrities, this is what I want your take on channeling celebrities and people doing seances to contact Michael Jackson um, Hitler, things like that. Do you believe that they're as easily accessible as just doing a seance and all of these people, you know, claim to be meeting with these celebrities and past people like that too? I, it's a good question. I mean, I love I, the example you gave earlier about people who are, you know, have these groups and they think they're Jesus. It is possible. They are channeling some of the apostles and thinking that that's them. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also possible. It's a great deal of ego. I don't, I mean, it is also, it is possible that they're channeling Michael Jackson. I, Princess Diana is the one that comes up a lot too. I get a lot of people say that thinking they were channeling Princess Diana and telling some very interesting things about her death. Uh, I don't know. I have mixed feelings on that. I've, I've never tried to channel a dead celebrity because quite frankly, I'd rather talk to a higher level spiritual being. I'm sure that Michael Jackson is great and he has a lot of nice things to say, but I'd rather talk to somebody who has something better to say. And I will say that our ego will very frequently get involved. So when we're hearing something that doesn't sound right, that's how you, you sort of know 
you know, the ego is, is the one that will say, I'm good and you're bad. Yeah. You're good and you're, this is right and this is wrong. Ego doesn't speak in shades of, of gray the way spirit guides do. Yeah. Spirit guides will very frequently say, sometimes this is the right thing to do. Sometimes you should eat meat. Sometimes you shouldn't. Sometimes you should, it's okay to have wheat. Sometimes it's not. You know, spirit guides will talk like that and they won't say things like you're bad, you're good, this is bad, this is good. They'll they'll say things like sometimes or yeah. or they'll just speak from a higher level of vibrational or they'll point out the higher level of it. I just I don't know that there's great value to channeling Michael Jackson. Um yeah. I mean you know, I'm not going to lie. I probably would go to some like, it sounds like fun. I mean, it sounds like fun, right? <laughs> Who wouldn't want? But just because I, I love, I'm a connoisseur of human folly. I love things yeah. that are weird and odd like that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not necessarily going to sign up for that person's, you know, seminar program to learn how to channel Michael Jackson because I just don't see any value in it. But I... It's a tough one. I would just say buyer beware. And I think a lot of us who are in the spiritual world, like you and I both are, We've been around this long enough to be able to smell BS pretty, yeah. pretty easily. And these people, the, the harder part is that some of these people that are channeling Michael Jackson and, and doing these things, they genuinely believe this. It's not, it's not like I'm hearing in their voice <laughs> that they're yeah. lying. They don't think they are. So, yeah. so that's why when she said, when that person says, I think she's really, I think he really is channeling Jesus. What I heard was she, he really thinks he really is channeling Jesus. So they don't necessarily think there are charlatans. Charlatans are a little easier to spot, but because they're easier to spot, there's not as many of them. But I think there's a lot of people that are more self-deluded than anything. Yeah, we want to believe this stuff, right? Yeah. We want to believe it. And, um, you know, that's and I and I, I bring all this stuff up just because I but I want it to be real. Like I want all of it. And a part of me think um, I mean, obviously, it's real to that person. Right. Mm -hmm. If they've encountered that and they've experienced it, whether I, I met with your grandmother or not, the message hit home and it brought closure. You know what I'm saying? That's that's that person's reality at the end of the day what, with any of this stuff, um, w which is a very interesting thing to look at as well, because when you do have the charlatans out there who are faking it, we've talked about this many a times on, on the podcast with, with different people. It's the fact that you know, there's a lot of people who fake this stuff because it brings about a beautiful experience for you. It brings about closure now because we act like we healed seven people who stood up out of a wheelchair when we prayed. Now, when it's time for us to pray for you and your ailment or you and your mental disorder, whatever you there's a level of expectation, which a lot of this stuff works off of placebo. How much do you believe it? If you really believe it, then you can achieve it. You can receive it. And that's that's the fact of the matter. If, if it's true to you and you believe it, you, you will receive it, whatever it is, with any of these encounters with, you know, all of this stuff that we experience. And there's more if you can believe it, right? We've seen some crazy things in our lives and our experiences. And it's it's opened up our mind to be able to receive more and to seek it out. So that's definitely happening. Um, are they justified in that, in the, the fake televangelist healing because people are getting healed? I asked one guy who's a magician. He says that he thinks it may be okay as long as money isn't involved, as long as they don't do the fake healing and then pass the offering plate or do a fake healing and fake fake regression and then charge you. What do you think about that? I mean, the people do have a deeper faith in God, a faith in the spirit world after some of this stuff. I mean, even one of the most, you know what I'm saying, uh, noted channelers or whatever, uh, Madame Blavatsky, I've got her books from the 1800s and all types of theosophy. Most of our spirituality is, is based off of a lot of her work, who in the end, was found out to be setting up a lot of encounters with children hiding under the house, tapping and dropping letters out of the, the roof and things like that. Are they justified? Or what would you say? I would say no. I, I love what he said, though. That's a good way of putting it, that it, as long as there's not money involved, there's not taking advantage of it. I can I kind of go gray on that and say, yeah, he might be onto something with that. But I, I absolutely say no, because even this lady who did this in the 1800s created this great movement. It, it hurts in the long run because everybody ends up figuring it out. Yeah. You know, and what, what if somebody's healing isn't complete? What if it's mostly, they're mostly, isn't there still benefit to that? You know, what if, 
their faith didn't didn't completely grab a hold of it and they didn't get 100% of the healing isn't there still benefit to not having to say it was lied you know it's it's a good question and I'm glad you're asking it um, because I can hear what you're saying is sometimes it comes from a place of love. I want to trick people so that they believe that all these great things are happening so that this wonderful thing really ends up happening. But eh, I don't know that the ends justify the means because especially in this day and age, I just think you know, it gets up, it ends up getting found out and then these people get discredited and yeah. then it hurts all of the messages that all of us try to say, it's better to be honest and be less than a hundred percent healed um, than to be, to lie and be a hundred, you know, have this hundred percent healing. And the other thing about David Wilcox, cause I'm a big fan of his. I, yeah, for sure. I, when I read his book, the way he worded when he said that he believed he was reincarnated from Edgar Casey, I didn't hear a lot of ego in that. I have heard people who said I was reincarnated from whatever, and their ego is just screaming it. When he talks about it, it's more instructional. Like, this is why I, I can do some of these things. This is why I've gotten this. And I didn't feel a big ego with it. But I know what you're talking about, how it did definitely hurt his credibility a, yeah. quite a bit. And I think a lot of people backed off of him after that. But I mean, when I actually read what he really wrote, it wasn't that bad. It mm -hmm. wasn't that bad. We've got a couple questions here. Um, so Bonnaroo, uh, thank you for the donation. He asked... Uh, two two part question. He just wants to know any hypnosis stories that uh that you can share that validates past life, uh, or your your most convincing story about past life regression. Like, what made you believe that? I mean, we all have heard. I mean, it, it goes both ways. We've heard the stories of the little kids who were drawn the way that they died and the the airplane crash and they were in the Vietnam War. We've heard all of those stories, and then we've seen other kids do that and then they were found out that their parents coached them you know there's a lot of different stuff but what what was it for you that really made you believe and or, or maybe even with some of your clients that made them believe that of an experience you could share so one of the first past life regressions i did after i got training because the first very first past life regression i did was an accident a person we're just going back to the original cause of something and uh, it actually went back into a past life and i went oh no now what do i do um, so then I went and got training, but the very first one after training, this was a friend of mine it was just a practice session we did on her couch and she is from China and she speaks with a very heavy Chinese accent. And when I hypnotized her, we went back and suddenly the accent was gone and suddenly the accent sounded very German to wow. me. So I had her go back to, and she ended up going back to a time she had wanted to get some clarity with, she was having a lot of trouble getting along with her dad. She couldn't figure out why they just couldn't seem to get along. So we go back to, um, someplace in Nebraska and she's describing the town and she's speaking in German. And I've had enough high school German to understand what she was saying. And I'm thinking, when did she learn German? Like, I, you know, because I've known this person a long time. And so I, after a while, I had to ask her for English because she exhausted my high school German. And I hadn't been, I wish it was one of the first ones I did. So I wasn't recording it. And so I didn't record it. But um, we were talking about what had happened and why she was having trouble with her dad. Well, her dad was her brother in that particular lifetime. And it was, I think the 18 or 1910 or 1915, something in that era. And they were using a thresher. I don't know if you know, it's a farm implement. It basically cuts the wheat. And her, her dad, who in that lifetime was her brother had accidentally pushed her off the thresher and, and she went under it. And that was the end of her. And her brother in that lifetime was so upset about this accident. Cause I think he just leaned on her or something like that had happened and she fell under it and, and got cut to bits. And she had to do a, we did a cool process where she forgave him and he forgave himself what he did. And then we brought her back and I brought her up into awakening consciousness. And I said, Hey, when did you learn German? She said, I don't speak any German. What are you, what are you talking about? She didn't even realize she'd been speaking German. She also knew everything that she said, even though it was in very clear German with a heavy accent. And it, she was got real clear about what happened with her dad, but the, the kind of the more miraculous part, although that's pretty miraculous, uh, it happened later because her dad called her that night and all of a sudden they were like having this conversation and they were chatting and everything was great again. And they were able to talk, they went to dinner and they now have a beautiful relationship. I still know this person, she's still my friend. I have no reason to believe that she would lie about not knowing German. I have no reason to believe that. And I had no reason to believe that she would somehow fake a German accent. I, I just, yeah. I can't even imagine that happening. So that's when I went, 
man, I mean, I've always believed in reincarnation, always have, but whether somebody could actually recall it, I wasn't sure if that was true until I had that experience. And it was, it was absolutely amazing. Um, okay. So here's something we've, we've talked about on here as well. When it comes back to reincarnation, a good friend of mine, um, Adam Starseed Bay, he was talking about how maybe, and this is just hypothetical, maybe it isn't past, past life regression. Maybe it's our DNA and we're able to access our ancestral, maybe it wasn't us, maybe it was ancestral DNA that we're tapping into and it's coming through. Um, that was an interesting way of, of looking at it as well. You're talking about the language changing, this woman automatically speaking in German. It's very interesting to look into. Um, again, you know, most of my stuff is from a Christian background, right? So I can I could bring this stuff up in the scriptures and in the Bible and then see how my spirituality relates back to it. Speaking in tongues in the book of Acts, right? Uh, there's during Passover, all of these people from all nations, tribes and tongues came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Um, and there was people there who spoke different languages. And when the Holy Spirit fell, uh, these people began to speak in tongues. And in this particular instance, these tongues were uh, legit languages. It's essentially like what you just said, a Chinese woman speaking German. And it was like declaring the wonderful works of God in their native tongue, supernaturally. Hey, I don't know German, but here you go. And they just would just tell all of these people speaking in tongues. And it was a miracle that happened. There's other instances later in the scripture that talks about like a supernatural language that comes through. Uh, that's pretty supernatural as well, right? I've been in, in very uh, uh, different uh, groups as well where a little, it's very similar, a little Chinese lady would, would uh, be there and she barely spoke English. But when people would speak in tongues, she automatically knew what they were saying. She had the gift of interpretation and knew what they were saying when they were speaking in different languages. She thought that everybody did. From my own experiences, I speak in tongues. It's a, it's a heavenly language. I've been writing down some of the syllables, trying to translate it. Okay, if there's something that I'm repeating over and over, why not try it? Google Translate became my best friend. I began to write down the syllables, put them together, type them into Google Translate, and it began to have messages we are for humanity. We are here to help heal, meet with us, spend time with us. Like these really interesting um, things that were coming through. There's that tongue that I have, and it's, it has its own dialect even, right? Sounds a lot similar to other people who do that. But there's a deeper level that has me intrigued, whether it is my ancestors speaking through me, whether it is my me reaching deep down into my spirit, I'm uh, part Native American as well. But when we get into some really deep prayer and really deep prayer where somebody is going through some really deep trauma, a lot of times it has to deal with emotional baggage, demonic possession, even uh, oppression. And when we get to this certain level, there is a different tongue that rises up in me and it sounds like an old Native American. When it comes out, it speaks with power and authority. There's usually something that happens really quick. The person breaks. They, whatever has been ailing them, leaves. And there's freedom that comes. Most of the people in the room can feel it. A lot of tears, a lot of freedom. Um, I can't just turn it off and on. It only comes out. I don't know if that's the true tongues of the Bible that we're talking about. Is it my ancestors who are like, hold on, let me assist you. It opens up a lot. We're left with a lot more questions at the end of the day to really write it in a book and teach it. What would you say to that? What, what What's your first in, impression uh, with that? Um, it sounds like you're channeling it. I mean, I, I'm a channel. It sounds like you're channeling it. And when you're channeling a spirit guide, they're not always going to show up uh, whenever you want them to. You have to get into the right state of mind, which if you're doing healing work, you're going to be start to get into that alpha state or that it, deeper state mm -hmm. of mind you're raising your vibrational frequency you have to keep in mind with spirit guides because they're at a high level of frequency vibration and we're down here they come down to our level and we go up to theirs and so so we're connecting in that way um but i would say that person's channeling it i liked i like that guy's theory about it being part of our ancestor line that certainly makes sense 
I find it hard to believe though that my client who's from China who has no ancestors that are German that she knows <laughs> of had a German ancestor and, and so I just don't think it explains all of yeah. them um, but I, I would absolutely believe that there is something to the fact that we may be channeling a, a higher level being. I will tell you a higher level being is giving these, I love what you said, these beautiful messages, these beautiful light messages, but your dead grandma, your dead grandma might say, you look ugly and yellow. You know, mm. your dead grandma might say something like your boyfriend's really worthless. I mean, it's, it's a little bit easier to spot that. Mm. Um, and when somebody's better in tune with their own spirituality, you can spot the ego playing a little bit too, because ego messages are very negative. Uh, ego messages might tell you to do something destructive. Uh, and I love that because you're such a higher level being, you're going to be able to spot when you're tapping into something that may not necessarily be at the highest level. Cause first of all, it's going to feel wrong. Your spirit guides are probably not going to let that come in, but you'll be able to be aware of the messages, which is why I get nervous when people talk about what you were talking about earlier, when somebody s says that they're, they're channeling this being and they're telling them that the women have to wear long skirts and can't cut their hair. <laughs> that's not a higher level being that's, that's either their ego or that's a lower level being. And the person just hasn't had enough experience with their own spirituality to be able to determine the difference and their own ego is just enjoying this power trip as well. So I think it's more channeling and I think you're channeling something very beautiful. I love the idea of you writing it down and creating a language. Maybe that was, maybe that's your mission. Maybe that's what you're supposed to do. And maybe that's why they're coming to you. Who knows? Maybe it's an alien being uh, speaking in a different language that you're able to somehow tap into because it's part of your lineage as a native American there's there's something about you and we we all have something like that yeah there's something special about you that makes it possible for this beautiful thing to happen with you that may not happen with somebody else it doesn't mean that somebody's less than or more than or that you're better in any way it just means that this is what you brought in with your vibrational frequency and your lineage and time and place and and all of that in the same space if that makes sense yeah definitely and you know i think the beautiful thing is that all of these scenarios are possible and plausible and probably all happening, right? It's probably a little bit of all of it mixed together and whatever we can decipher and try to put it together to, you know, make some sense out of. And everybody has their portion, what they're good at, right? You learn what that is and do it really good. Um, what you said about, you know, the grandmother coming through and just getting on to you and say, hey, you need to get your stuff together or just, I don't like it when you wear that hat. You know, that offends me or whatever. Um, so here's the notion again, maybe with the celebrities or people channeling Hitler or whatever the case is. And I've heard, um, you know, I think you get into trouble when you just kind of maybe even play with the Ouija board and say any spirit that's here that wants to come through. We're looking to talk to you again. When I went through my crazy experiences, I essentially did that. I wanted to open my body up as a channel for anything. There was no boundaries. I just wanted to. I wanted it to happen and it did and it was more than I could a uh, bit off more than I can chew but the notion that the spirits on the other side just because they have passed and they're not here anymore I don't think that means that they're necessarily good people right um, and I've been s saying that there's other other psychics and, and, and mediums who come on and say no they've they've learned their lesson they've ascended now they're on the other side I do believe in poltergeist I believe that you know maybe the guy who you're channeling in your home or the ghost you're seeing maybe he was a child molester and you know I don't think he's ascended just because he's crossed over what where, where do you sit with that with the ego and the different beings and people who carry darker energy now that they're on the other side are they better people do they get it now or are maybe some of them are still here lurking and, and looking to, to mess with people uh i don't necessarily see as much dark stuff because i've sort of asked my spirit guides i don't really want to see that yeah. stuff um <laughs> But one of the things I do get a lot, though, when I do a mediumship is I will hear a lot from from like a dead. Let's say you've had a it's always the creepy uncle, a creepy uncle or the yeah. creepy grandfather who is the child molester. Mm -hmm. What I've heard many times from them and also from their spouses, which I will sometimes bring through, is that there's a there's classes they have to take. There's learning that they have to go through to try and heal what they did within themselves because that's 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 something in there and these classes are voluntary so if they choose not to do it yeah. they may not grow as a person um but absolutely I, I don't believe that if just because somebody doesn't have a body anymore they've somehow become a saint yeah you know 
my own <laughs> my own mother-in-law who did not didn't really love me like a daughter she's a nice person but she you know we didn't click she has through a medium given a not nice message to me <laughs> which was really funny but it's not always this beautiful love and light. I mean, there's still people. You you can't just assume that because they've died that they're now saints. Um, in terms of the darker energy, you know, do you want to talk to the child molester uncle if unless they have something to say, telling you how sorry they are, or that's part of their healing journey? You get to decide if you're going to a medium if you want to talk to this person or not. But there, I 100% because I've heard this many times from people from people I've brought through is that there is definitely some classes that they can take to, to, to heal what they've done, to learn their lessons on the other side, but it is easier to learn them on this side. Yeah. But if they didn't, if they missed the lesson, or if they didn't learn how to be a better person, they get a chance to do it on the other side for sure. Yeah. Isn't that what, um, uh, you know, reincarnation is though. Like it's that karmic loop loop, like you, because you were, a bad person because you didn't respond with love or, or learn the, the lessons while you were here you're reincarnated into another lifetime or some people believe another um being maybe i don't have heard things such as animals and trees and things like that and you have to experience that life to learn your lesson and kind of pay for the wrong that you've caused on the earth and things like that so that's that, i mean that would be the whole thing about reincarnation right so that people can reincarnate here to learn the lessons over and over in this this plane of existence i still think there's some in, some classroom like instruction though you know um i i may be given a brand new car but if i don't read the manual if i don't take some time to learn how to drive this cool car but i got i got one like that where i really did need to read the manual because the car was so complicated <laughs> Um, but you know, I, so you have to get this car and experience it and learn how to do it in order to learn the lesson. I still think there's some classroom instruction because I think there's, there's things that the person misses unless they get higher level training on the other side. Um, but yes, the karmic loop, absolutely. But I, I think there's another part to it. The other thing that we haven't talked about that is probably good to mention is there's something about b parallel lives. People might be living more than one lifetime at a time. So sometimes you're bringing activities into this lifetime that you may be experiencing in another lifetime in another body, in another part of the country where you're living at this exact same time. And that can be part of this as well. Absolutely. That's interesting. Yeah. The, the whole uh, parallel life, lifetimes and so much stuff. And that would, you know, people have these weird dreams, man. I remember as a little kid, like in, it was sometimes or maybe I couldn't sleep or I feel like it happened when I was sick that I would always like maybe I had the flu or something. I would go to this weird place and this looking out of like a different person's eyes or what type of scenario. And, um, and, and I would go there throughout my childhood, maybe every few years or something, but it was a place that was all too familiar, but I could, I couldn't explain or wrap my head around what was happening but it was like another life. And it's, it's very interesting to, to explore that what's going on. Um, as far as like passing the test and learning the lessons for me, I teach that it's responding like Christ responding to every situation with love and respect. And that's how you pass. Don't freak out. Trust your higher power, trust God and respond with love. Um, does that sound like a good way how to pass these tests and things that we're taking here at responding with, with love and, and understanding and compassion? I love that. It's beautiful. I also like the idea of looking at why you do the things you do. So uh, the creepy grandfather who molested somebody, it would be helpful for him to understand that it's, you know, that's a learned behavior. So somebody did it to him to understand how to have this experience and not pass it on to someone yeah. else. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, responding like Christ is, is beautiful. It's just that that's the bigger message on uh, the nitty gritty sometimes is yeah. understanding the particulars of why somebody mm -hmm. did the things they did so that they don't do it again. Yeah. Um, I know we always look at the perpetrator and we say they're a bad person and they're terrible, but if you can look at the bigger picture and understand what motivated them, how did they become like this? We can understand more about ourselves by seeing the chain of how this evolution happened so that we can stop it before it starts within our own selves. Yeah. Because we all have, I'm sorry, we all have the ability to do bad things. And we've, we've been the perpetrator in a past lives. We've been the victim in a past lives. We've been both. So none of us is nominated for sainthood yet. 
And if you're a victim of some kind of a crime, I'm not telling you that this is that you've done this in a past life, but there may be something in this that you're supposed to learn. And frequently when people are a victim of a crime in this lifetime, I've seen this a million times, that is the instigation for them to become a healer and teach other people how to heal from it. So I, I firmly believe that these things don't just happen to you randomly, although they sometimes they do, randomly for no reason. There's something in this for you to learn and pass on to someone else. And that's where, that's where the gift comes in because the gift becomes the gift for all of us. When you have something happen that's bad mm -hmm. and you learn how to fix it, if you show me, if you write a book and you leave the breadcrumb yeah. trail and show me how to fix it within myself. Yeah, that's so beautiful. You know, the scripture says that what the enemy meant for your harm, God will turn in turn use it for your good. So the mm -hmm. things that were used to kill you are going to be your strengths and you're going to bring healing to those people. Again, you have a natural empathy. You don't have to act like you care. You really do. Right. You, and, and it's natural. So it's so awesome. Jill, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thank you for coming on, hanging out with me. You got a bunch of really cool stuff on your website. You have some courses, some books. And again, you do private one on one sessions uh, mm -hmm. to really go into hypnotherapy. We didn't really I think we kind of I think all of this has something to do with hypnotherapy. But there's a bunch more resources on your website. If you wanted to direct traffic that way and let people know what you got going on, this would be a good time to do that. I appreciate it. Uh, my, my website is soulconnecthypnotherapy.com. And I wrote a book called Tales from the Trance. It's about client experiences. I tell a lot more stories than we got today, including a couple of the ones that we talked about today. And if you go to my website, if you go to soulconnecthypnotherapy slash tales, you can actually download the first 30 pages for free. So you can see if you like the book before you invest in it. Um, I, I see clients remotely using Zoom. I do uh, phone appointments and I also see clients in person in my Encinitas office, but there's all kinds of free stuff. There's free meditations. I give a lot of stuff for free away on my website because I want people to get better and heal themselves. And I would love to come visit, come visit my website at soulconnecthypnotherapy.com. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. You guys make sure y'all go over there, support, download her stuff, sign up for her email list, all that cool stuff. Let's do it again uh, pretty soon. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you so much. All right, my friend, have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye. -bye. Jill Thomas, ladies and gentlemen, hypnotherapy, past life regression, beautiful stuff, man. Um, healing comes to the broken places first, whatever you're going through, man, seek out that healing. And again, it's, it becomes like layers of, of the onion. You get healed from one thing. And then once that thing moves out of the way, you find out that there's just layers upon layers of, of, um, of, of hurt. And, uh, and then there's layers of layers upon he for healing speaking healing to all that stuff and again the ripple effect that it has you heal yourself and you cut off that negative thing that was happening in your family tree whatever it is if, if your, your family tree your family lineage lineage has a um a history of abusive fathers abusive mothers whatever it is someone Always, someone posted, you know, why is it always the, the fathers? Why can't it be the mothers? Abusive mothers, mothers who, you know, don't care, who don't show up, who abandon their children. Um, and it usually it's what we call a generational curse. It begins to happen over and over the same thing in every generation. You can cut that off. You can also, in the midst of that, create a blessing for your your, your family lineage that they'll be blessed in a, in, in a thing. And it's very practical as well. It's spiritual, but it's very practical. I mean, look at family businesses and how that operates. I mean, I, I have friends of mine who are preachers and they're preachers because they were born into it. Their dad was a pastor. Their grandfather was a pastor. So it's only right for them to be a pastor. It's in the family business. Um, and so they, they grow into it. Essentially it's like father, like son, you just like your dad. Now, the good qualities, the bad qualities. For me, as a child of God, as a, as a Christian, as a believer in Christ, I'm just like my father, my father in heaven. You know, I, I, I want to uh, have his qualities, right? I want to abandon the fleshly nature of my father who was a drunk or who is a drunk and who walked out on his family, right? I don't want those qualities. And if you don't, if you don't cut it off by default, you're, you're headed down that path. That's the default. Is to just perpetuate the cycle, the hurt, the abuse. I, we come from a long line of men who abuse their wives. I grew up seeing uh, 
my mom get, you know, beat up by boyfriends and my cousins and uncles putting their hands on it. You have to stop it. It ends with me, whatever it is. And it, it, so the spiritual, the spiritual essence of, of cutting it off, it stops with you. You be the change that you want to see and the ripple effect that it has going down from generation to generation. Again, the energy that you're putting out, healing yourself, healing those around you, healing other people, they're going to go out and do more. So just because you you get yourself together and then you begin to influence those other people around you from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Start at home. Start within. This is something big, man. We got to understand that everybody wants to change the world. You want to end abortion. You want to end this and end that and pass legislation. How's that working for you? How's it working? Change yourself. You start within. I have friends, and I, I was even in it, rallying at the freaking you know, events and, and doing all these marches and all kind of stuff, trying to change legislation. It doesn't work that way now. You have to change yourself to thine own self be true. Start with yourself and then you can change your family. And then that affects your friends. And then that affects your city, then your uh, state, then the nation, and then the world because of the work that you're doing within. You're doing the work that you're supposed to be doing, bringing forth healing to the nations. That's the only way it's done arguing with people, debating, how's that working for you? Probably running people off, you know, trying to find people who just agree with you and, and believe in what you have to learn some empathy, man, learn long suffering. You know, that's one of the fruits of the spirit, right? Being able to suffer with someone for a long time, not just not being easily offended and running people off when they, you know, disagree with you or whatever the case is, man. Love keeps no record of wrong. Again, change yourself. Start with yourself. This is what it's about. Change the world. Only you can do it. So with that being said, I'm going to say peace and shalom. Again, if you guys are patrons, head on over there. Check out the Patreon. I'm going to upload a new song this evening. And a uh, bunch of cool stuff coming out. Again, just to keep you guys updated, I've been working on this meditation for a while. Writing it, perfecting it. And it's coming out really good. It's coming out really good. Uh, I might record it today. Who knows? Not sure. I got another interview that I'm doing right after this. Follow me on Facebook. If you guys aren't, I'll share that out. I'll be going live on someone else's podcast um, talking about facilitating spiritual encounters. Again, just really talking about what we've been talking about. It's like if you believe it, then you can receive it. And if you b set your faith to that level, you can expect it. How else are you going to see UFOs? How else are you going to summon light ships? Unless you believe it. Go out there and try that stuff, man. Most of you have. You've seen it. It built your faith to really uh, start believing some really interesting encounters. And we all have them. We have stories galore. Not just me. A bunch of my friends. Most of, most of you listen can tell me uh, beautiful stories and encounters and what it what it did for your, your faith and what it did for your psyche. So, yep, we're going to be doing it. Patreon.com backslash Truthseeker. See you guys on the other side. Peace, peace. Yo, so much higher than mine, so much higher than mine, so much deeper than mine, so much deeper than mine. Well, that does it for this episode, folks. To hear more episodes of the Truth Seeker podcast, head over to truthseeker.com. And if you're wanting to support the show and get rewards, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash truthseeker.